Hello and welcome to the first Urban Urban Agoge podcast. It's the Friday the 17th of May and we're four weeks into the whole Urban Agoge thing. And I'm joined today by Harlequin over in Australia, who is the only poor Hello. soul, you know, that's actually doing this along with me. So you're part of the grand experiment. How are you doing, man? Uh, I am fairly well. I'm half past Saturday here. And... Yes. Yes, it's like half past Saturday. seven in the morning in Australia and uh, coming it's, up to it. Yeah, it's half past seven in the morning. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have to work night shift last night. But that was all right. I just I just went for a wander instead. And uh, in my normal night shift, in my normal night shift, I went for a walk in the dark. So, if you've been following Urban Agoge in any way at all, um, you'll know that uh, anybody that's doing it quickly establishes a morning routine. So, what did you do when you when you achieved consciousness this morning? Uh, the first time I achieved consciousness, I worked out it was dark still, so I went back to sleep because hmm. that was like three o'clock in the morning. I was like, I don't even need to look at my clock because because we're going into winter here, you can sort of tell when it's getting light, and you know what time it is. The first time I went back to sleep, because it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm like, I'm not getting out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning to check the watch, check the, check the time in the kitchen. And this next time, I was like, aha, now the, now the sun is up. It is time for me to get out of bed. So I got out of bed. Well, I actually didn't even get out of bed. What I did was I fold my... I actually have... I sleep on my own, so it's quite easy. I get my I get my blanket, because I sleep under a woolly blanket, because I'm that kind of person. I get my woolly blanket and my, and my sheet, and I fold it down a third, and then I get that, that two-thirds, and I fold that down a third again, and then I have a made bed. Then I... And I clambered my my hairy bummed ass out of bed, and uh, and what did I do then? Oh, I checked to see what time it was. Uh, I went and found my phone and I checked to see what time it was. It was like, am, am I like hours too late to do this? Uh, yeah. Excuse me, I'm drinking water. Um, what did I do next? Then I got out of bed and then I got a glass of water, and then I went to the bathroom as I am old and I don't wake up particularly in the middle of the night, so I always need to go to the bathroom when I get out of bed. One of those exciting things we get old. Um. Yeah, I just try to be quiet because it's early, and everyone went to bed really late last night here. No, oh, right. Yeah, it's that right. sort of. And then get... I think I sent you a message saying, "I, I think I, I think I came out to the shed, went to the bathroom, and then sent you a message saying I am now awake, or okay. somewhat awake." Yeah. yeah. I, I think of the productivity, although it's still dark there. You're you're up and making creative stuff straight away. That's true. That's true. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Well, so... this was the time that this is the you know. I'm sure we'll get back to this, but this is the issue you have is that, you know, unless you make time for the thing you want to do, you will never get it done because yeah. if you're at all like me, you have a million other things that you quote unquote must or quote unquote have to do in a day. And if you don't do the thing you want to do, then you were never going to do it. Yeah. You really have to sort of get up and out and do your thing. I mean, I've got a, tw a midday start tomorrow, but as I'm making yeah. a video every day, I've literally got to get up, grab a glass of water, neck that, get out of bed and get out into the woods and film because it takes me if i blur on for about 45 minutes which is a, which has happened um mm. it takes well over an hour to render the file which is yes. why i've adopted a very straightforward streamlined editing style i've got a blank template with all the stuff that stays the same and yep. i literally change the bits on the template and then add in the video and you know if there's a gap in it or a break because my little camera will only record for 15 minutes at a time I'll assemble it all yes. and then sync in the sound because I'm using a separate video mm. recorder. So it takes about half an hour on a good day to edit about half an hour's worth of video, which is lightning fast. Mm. You know, that's amazing. Yeah, if you can edit the video it should take. Yeah, in less time good. than it yeah, takes yeah. to shoot it or about the same time, yeah. you know, you're doing really well because normally it's it works out as about an hour a minute, you yeah. know, or it can be as much as 10 hours a minute. Which is what I've I've had with music videos. Syncing the sound is a little different, which is why I'm glad I've got mm. like a good 1080p action camera. I thought I when I was watching them back on YouTube, I had a quick look at a couple of the videos today because I I don't watch them once they're uploaded. I watch them as I'm editing no. them, and I've already seen everything about three times by that time. Yes, and uh, yeah, I had YouTube set to like 480p, so I was thinking, oh, it's really degrading the shit out of it. And then I upped it to 1080p, and it's like, oh, that's pretty clear apart from the certain amount of shaky cam and aggravation but uh yeah, yeah but i think i think that's i think that's a standard like you know i I did, i've done the same thing when i've uploaded stuff and i've gone oh shit i'm watching it at like 144p so i can stream it yeah what watch it but when you watch it at 1080p watch it, going, like, oh. it looks nice so if you download it, it yeah. and then watch it back if you download it at 1080p mind you that take you about five hours wouldn't it yeah yeah i might have probably would but yeah it's it's not too bad 
So yeah, yeah, I mean, so this is nearly four weeks into Urban Agoge, you know. So we haven't. Yeah, haven't I think I'm. I think long. I'm a day behind you because I fell over. Oh, I didn't fell over. I well, I fell over lots, but I didn't fall over. I fell over in a metaphysical sense last week. Mm. So I'm I'm like one run behind, and I went nah, sod it, and just kept going. Yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. So I'm now on a Tuesday. I'm now on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So I have to go for a run today, mm. at some point in my day yeah, before I go to work tonight. Today's a rest day according to the Army Fitness thing which i'm trying to keep yeah. to and, yeah and then next week i will be back on mondays wednesdays fridays because it's a shit ton easier to do yeah. it on a monday wednesday friday worked out yeah it's, it's tons easy for me to do all the extra bits on a friday although i didn't get to record the trailer although i have mm. prepped for recording the trailer tomorrow so by the time it yes. goes up and by the time i start hassling people and say look i've done this thing because that's part of my marketing strategy to get it to as many people as possible um yeah and just see if we can get a, a more of a global experiment mm. um so yeah so that's a tomorrow morning thing because i need about two minutes of video i've already downloaded some uh sort of like shocking images of you know global problems which is part of yes. where, where we're going with this uh so i need about two minutes of of of, of spoken and video mm. so i need to figure some stuff out for that tomorrow but i've got a, i've got a place where i can do it because I was going to go out into the woods today and record like the two minutes, but I realised that because it's summer here, and it's I know it's winter there, but um, everybody seems to be out for a wander, so I'm having to yeah, cut, gotta, I'm having to cut video so I don't have you. bystanders. But people have been pretty yeah. good actually. They see me there with a selfie stick and an action camera, and I just go, no, I'm just talking to myself basically. Uh, and people are like, yeah, okay. That's the good thing about England. You know, in Scandinavia, they would say, wait here and call someone to come and help you. Whereas in England, it's like, you know, a person's a person's own personal crazy is their own goddamn business. I mean, if, I think if I was doing it in America, people might sort of put hands near guns, depending on where you were in the country. Um, yes. But uh, yeah, you can get away with it in the UK. And I think there's a certain tolerance for eccentricity in Australia as well. You know. Uh, well, everyone thinks I'm mad anyway, so it yeah. doesn't make a difference. Uh, I'm, I'm mad... more known to be left alone in the local area. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. I just I just chop out my interactions with people. Although, coming on to something we'll be talking about in a little while, there's um, uh, there's there's a there's a reason for that. So, yeah, yeah. So, what what we've been doing with the Urban Agoge thing is building useful habits which is something that if you read any sort of self-help book or you've watched any TED Talks or anything like that, you'll be aware that that's sort of like one of those things that people say is easier said than done. But weirdly, it's easier done than explained. It's, yes. know, it's, it's one of those things. Yeah, Just funnily, do it. funnily enough, it's actually, it's actually harder to write the book describing to someone the, the 15 things they actually need to do in the morning rather yeah. than, you know, rather than just get them to actually do it seemingly. Yeah, so about... You know. Two months ago, I, I put a little notice near my door of things to do before I sit down when I get in of the of an evening, because it just makes my life so much easier. You know, because I work in a kitchen, so you need a clean uniform every day. Um, really, yeah. I mean, there you know there are probably people out there that work as chefs that go, oh no, that's all right. You know, I'll just put the same one on. But and even though I don't work with food directly, I prefer to have a clean pair of trousers and clean t shirt. Yeah. You know. Because I don't need to wear a chef's top unless anybody comes around and complains about it. So I, I put together this evening routine that just saves me a rush. You know, because when I rush, I tend to forget things. So mm. what I do in the evening is just go, right, okay, clean uniform, clean clothes for tomorrow morning. Um, you know, make sure all my things like my phone is charged. Um, not because I'm essentially addicted to any like live data thing, but I use it as an MP3 player. So I listen to books when I'm uh, when I'm working because I don't have to interact with people in order to do the washing the dishes because if I did get need that human interaction I'd probably go crazy I think they're pretty surprised that I've done it for two and a half years and not gone actually mad with only like 15 seconds of human interaction from everybody in that works in the restaurant shift, yeah. yeah you go bonkers right. especially on like an eight or nine hour day shift yeah. So I put together all human my stuff. Human beings are not designed to live without this, without stimuli of other humans. Yeah, you go a bit bonkers. You get proper cabin fever, yeah. even though you're surrounded by people mm. all the time. You can't maintain a conversation. So mm. that's what I do, and that's what I've been doing for a while. Mostly it's been fiction, but I've started doing more, you know, sort of self-help books. 
But yeah, so all my shit needs to be charged up and my phone will last an eight hour shift. My headphones, because I've got Bluetooth headphones, because cables just get snagged on everything. And if you put them inside your t-shirt yep. and you perspire at all, you, you get really uncomfortable with just a wire trailing across your chest. Especially if you're yeah. tubby like I am. Um, so I was doing that and then it was like, oh, that's actually working. And then I was just by chance listening to a few self-help books and it says, oh, get a routine together. And it's like, oh, I'm doing that. What else could I do? And then it came up to sort of like, you know, what can I do in the morning to make myself more efficient? And everybody that ever sort of like mentions that says, oh, get up early. Get up at 4.30 in the morning and sort of like just like, you know, soldier on through the day. And I, I can't do that because I work till 11 o'clock at night. It takes me a couple of hours to wind down after work when I get in. And then I go to bed. So I start. Yeah, the, you know. Yeah. That's the, that's the problem is I think I think most people are dismissive of that idea of getting up early because they don't realize what get up early means. And, and it shouldn't be, you know, it, that's where it fails. You know, your average person who comes home from work at, say, five o'clock or six o'clock and then has dinner and then does nothing for until 12 till 12 or one o'clock in the in the in the in the morning yeah you know they're absolutely fine to say at nine o'clock i'm going to set an alarm for 8 30 yeah. and i'm going to stop whatever i'm doing at 8 30 then at nine o'clock i'm going to be in bed you know like in bed have had a glass of water been to the bathroom have done everything all the lights are going to be turned off i'm just going to fucking lay there and have like you know 10 minutes meditation of yourself and then go to sleep hmm. you know and then you can get up at five o'clock four o'clock in the morning and be perfectly functional you know but the issue is is when you go on work shift work for starters or when you have a varying um a varying um a varying roster every week as i do hmm. um or you as you do you work nights every single night yeah six you know? nights a week six evenings a week um, till about ten, ten thirty, on average. Yeah. So going to bed at, at like up past ten or eleven o'clock is isn't all that useful. Um, mm. For which you know that's when you need to go to bed in order to get at least six, seven hours sleep in order to get up at like four thirty in the morning. And if you work yeah. a nine to five job, then yeah, four thirty, five o'clock in the morning, get the jump on your day, and do you can mm. then you know do some exercise or do something creative. And there is a direct correlatory link between getting exercise and being creative. There's yeah. so, there's something about it that gives you like a complete hit um, of all yeah. your brain chemicals that allows your brain to go into creative mode. Because your brain's like a toddler. Un un unless you're there yet, unless it's had a snack and a colouring book and pencils and a hug, mm. then it's useless. It's going to throw a paddy and, yes. and not do anything useful. Which is which is pretty embarrassing, really. Everybody wanders to the earth thinking that they're this evolved individual, and we're really not. It's just, but there are tricks to do it. So in the morning, yeah. you know, um, the useful habits that we've got, we've got what, seven useful habits that we've we've nailed down so far. That I think both of us yeah. <clears throat> of of thing and getting up early is one of them. Get up early for you. You know, I don't yeah. really need to get out of bed till about three o'clock in the afternoon, and for the last couple of years. I haven't really pressured myself to do anything, which meant that I've got mm. nothing done. Um, my house is a complete yeah. pigsty, yeah. which isn't too, which means that when I find something, when I need to look for something, I need to turn it into more of a pigsty. And then, <laughs> you know, find the yeah. you find that you're, you're not going into certain rooms if you can avoid it because mm. it's so untidy and it, you know, it will depress you. So getting up yeah. early. Uh, the other thing, which is just annoying as anything, make your bed. Yes. Um, and yeah. I think Joe Rogan sets it straight, you know, when some, I think somebody questioned him, so why did it take you until you were 30 to make your bed when you got up? And he was like, well, cause that's your mum telling you so that you make your bed. So if anybody comes around your house and has a look around, they're not embarrassed. It's like a social thing, which doesn't mean anything yeah. to you as a kid. No, but if you make you your bed, house proud when you're a child. yeah, you don't give a shit what, what, you know, what somebody that's visiting your house thinks if they happen to see that your bedroom door's open. I mean, anybody with any sense doesn't want to look into a teenager's room anyway. No. But the reason you make your bed is that, it's, and it's so embarrassing, you get one success straight away, first thing in the yeah. day. You've got one thing that you planned and you succeeded at, which changes your brain yeah. chemistry, which is bloody annoying. And I think, I think like, I have a little routine because I've made my bed now. Like, I, I've been doing it for, for yonks before this because it's just one of those things that I hate having a messy bed. It's mm. one of those things that drives me bonkers. And I've done it. Like, I've, you know, my room can be a filthy mess, but I've always made my bed when I get out of bed. Mm. 
but I have this little routine is like, you know, when I get up and I make my bed, yeah. I think to myself, I'm doing something for the future me. Yeah. You know, that's what's going through my head as I'm sitting up and make, I'm making my bed for the future me. And when I get into bed, you know, you can be tired as all sin, but then I try and go through my head, you know, thank you to the past me for making the bed. Yeah. Doesn't look nice. Which is one of those stupid, like, self helpy things to do. Yeah, for me, but it's, it's, but it's, it's actually it, like it's not. It's not. It's actually like really, really nice. Yeah. Because you're acknowledging the fact that, hang on a second, you know, you know, sixteen hours ago, whatever the hell it is, twenty hours ago, no, it's less than that. Yeah, sixteen hours ago, like you know, sixteen hours ago, I made the time for myself to go and do this thing for myself. Yeah. And then you know, tomorrow I'll try and do the next thing better. And it's not know? making your bed so you can bounce a corner off the hospital corners that you've done, unless that's your thing. No, it's just it's just purely folding your blankets back and then straightening your pillow up and making you know, making your bed not look like a filthy mess. And yeah. there's actually like there's some there's some physiological stuff where it actually like you know it actually makes sense to go and do this. Oh because yeah, you the, get, um... you get off to sleep faster if your bed's made. I mean, I've I've yeah. basically got because it's it's not quite warm enough late at night for me to have just one duvet on the bed. I've got two, yeah. but one of them yeah. is a, is a bit slippery because it's a, a Polish army over blanket for design yeah. for like sub zero temperatures. So I thought that would be a good second mm. duvet. I nearly bought a second duvet to go over the top. And then I realized I had like crates and crates of bushcrafting equipment. So I dug that. <laughs> yes. Put it in a duvet. Which is cover. where my blanket came from. Yeah. You know, my blanket is actually one of my bushcraft, one of my bushcraft blankets. Yeah. It's a big, thick German army wool blanket. That's yeah, the, I've the got thickest one, of those. one you could buy, I think. But, you know, so I've essentially got two duvets on my bed. And if you don't make it, then it all gets rucked up inside the, the duvet case or the duvet mm. cover. So actually having made it means that I can get into bed easily, just pull the two duvets back, and I'm already comfortable. Yeah. So if you're already comfortable rather than you have to rearrange the and warm, more importantly, because it's, I live in Manchester in the north of England and it gets cold. And I don't have mm. central heating. Yeah. Purely because it, it, they were they were messing me about as far as the gas supply goes, and I realised that I I've got a, 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 a an electric shower, so I don't need mm. hot and I don't have a bath, so I don't need hot water as such, except for washing up. And rather than pay yeah. three or four hundred pounds a year, I can pay you know a fraction of that just to boil water in order to do the washing up. I only have to wait like yeah. thirty seconds for a, for a two liters of boiled water. You add that to cold, yeah, and you've got water warm enough to do your dishes. So, you know, I don't have central heating, so if it, it can be too fuck, too cold if you've only got one duvet. Hence the whole duvet thing. And if you don't make it, it's it's a pain in the pain in the bum to get into. Hmm. So, you know, it's it's just like your personal comfort at the end of yeah. the day as well. I hadn't thought about the gratitude thing, although a lot of the self help books say be grateful for a few things every morning or every evening when you get up. Yeah, I, I find it funny. It just it's one of those little things. I don't think I don't think I've ever read it anywhere. Yeah. Um, I think I think I got onto folding my bed again Damn. after listening to now Jocko I'm... Willi- Willi- Is it Jocko Willick? I can never yeah. say his name. Jocko Willinick. Yeah. Willick. Willinick. Yeah. Um about it was it was either him or it was someone from the US Navy. I'm sure I'll find it somewhere or other. It was like, mm. you know, in the it was a it was a TED talk. Um and it was all about um making your bed. Mm. And I was like I showed it I showed it to the kids when they were little. But they were like, This they... is the reason why you should make your bed. And funnily was... enough, now the boys are actually gotten they actually get it now um and they actually do make their beds you know they get up um they get up and they make their beds most you know most days not always but i guess you it's, know. i guess it depends on who tells you and why when you're a kid yeah if you can see a good reason or even a person yeah. to emulate if you sort of like say right there's this navy seal guy who is the hardest person yeah. on earth you know, he's a yeah. black belt in about five different martial arts. He will kick five your ass, yeah. no matter yeah. who you are. The guy is t- fucking terrifying. I mean, anybody that's yes. got the the now the the chutzpah to be a PT instructor to Navy SEALs is someone you don't yeah. you don't annoy or get on the wrong side yeah. of, or you want having a bad exactly. impression of you. Yeah. Um, so you know, and there was another guy that's um, that's like this monk that Russell Brand was interviewing, and he he. The, the the guy that's the the monk that also does um, personal actualization now um, t- mm. said that the, basically this monk said that you know for three thousand years you know holy people in India have got up and made their bed it's a thing yeah you know it's been a it's thing a for thing. an extremely long time and I guess if somebody said yeah. oh I, you know Tibetan monks do this or Indian you know uh, Krishna consciousness monks do this then it depends on what plugs into you as somebody that you can imagine as wanting to impress I mean hell if, if it's yeah. got to be Obi-Wan Kenobi or Mr. Miyagi 
or Tony Stark yeah. or whoever, whatever, whichever mm. fictional or non-fictional ideal of a human that you want to emulate says it, pretty much everybody says it. You know, make your bed, just do it. And if yeah. you just you just go, right, okay, even if you don't believe what we're saying, try it for a week. And if you aren't happy yeah, because then, you've yeah. made your bed when you've got up, <laughs> I mean, I sometimes get then up, and, get up and come downstairs and then go, oh, shit, I didn't make my bed, and go back up and make it. But I, these days, I never go out of the house before the bed's made. Yeah. You know, it might not be immediate. But it is better if it's immediate. You know, if you and it's a habit I'm trying to do, like the getting out of bed at seven o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I do, yeah. sometimes I don't, but it's a little bit later. But I am out of bed before the, the sort of like one or two o'clock in the afternoon. I, I I did a few months ago. Yes, I found the name. I found the name of the uh, of the of the person. It's Naval Admiral William H. McRaven, uh, BJ seventy seven, Ninth Commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command. There you go. So if that if you know if if, if an admiral can tell you to make your bed nicely yeah then uh then that's good it's, it's the also... university of texas of austin 2014 commencement address i think he was getting i don't know what the commencement address is in in at a university in the states but that's what it was yeah it's it's it basically I remember, I, I remember finding it on youtube and sending it to the boys and saying there you go there's a reason to make your beds yeah and it's a, it's an interesting thing it's like you know it's one of the things if you do army selection training the first thing that they have you do that they ask you to do is make your bed I mean, mm. mostly so they can say that's bloody terrible you know when I told you yeah. to make your beds you know I showed you how to make a bed mm. you know and they, they do watch you to see if you help other people make their beds yeah you know if you you know if you make your own bed and then stand by it and they're just like okay well you can do as you're bloody told but you're not non-com material because literally day one they start tack it, tagging you um, for every single thing they watch you do. That's why they have you do such a wide variety of stuff. So if you are thinking yeah. of going into the military, the first thing they look for is can you do as you're told and can you mm. watch something, concentrate on it, and then do it reasonably precisely compared to what you were told. You know, mm. They don't ask you to do anything difficult and then they see if you're going to help your mm. mates. And if you're going to help your mates, they tag you for section leader and stuff like that. You know, They give you five people to look after. To yeah. see if you can get those to do, because five people is what a lance corporal is responsible for. Yeah, you'll have a lance corporal and a corporal the first. First in your heady steps, to getting yeah. out of to get getting up in yeah. the ranks. Just basically to get what what in America they call boot chevrons. And if you yeah. and if you basically become a section leader and you manage to maintain that through for a decent proportion of basic training, you're already pre considered to be a non commissioned officer. So bear yeah. that in mind if you're planning on joining the military. Okay, so we'll, we'll rattle on forward a little bit. Um, so drink water as soon as you wake up. That's more a physiological thing, but also a preparedness thing. You've prepared the night before that you've got a glass of water by your bed. Um, I remember. I remember reading about. I remember reading about ten years ago now that you should drink a liter of water on waking. I'm not on waking up, but before you do anything else, like you know, you should get up and you should drink a liter of water. Yeah, That's I, the first thing. I probably you, get about half first thing that. You do. And I could never drink a litre of water when I woke up, but I could yeah. certainly drink two glasses of water quite happily. Yeah. Which was half you a litre of water in my house. About that. So, there you go. I mean, I must admit, I'm still, I'm still addicted to this coffee thing. I'm going to try and move to black tea with some honey in it um, for tomorrow morning and just see before I go mm. out the door. So, you know, a large, you know, at least 300 ml of water and a cup of tea. Just mm. to sort of get, you know, more or less every culture in the world has a hot drink to drink. I don't think coffee does you as much good as, say, tea will. I think there's a lot more done to coffee before they give it to you. Um, the next one is... Obviously, depending on where you buy a coffee from. Yeah, but that actually it yeah. signals to your brain that you want to do stuff, drinking water. Mm. So it's sort of like an all-hands-on thing. I found an thing. interesting thing, actually, that coffee, that coffee uh, although it tries to wake you up, uh, there was some research study done. I don't know how truthful it is, but there was some research done that someone was telling you about that said that for coffee to actually be like the most effective thing ever, when you're tired and you drink coffee because you want to wake up, what you have to do is you have to drink the coffee and then go have a little like nana nap for like ten minutes, right? Yeah. And actually have a nap for ten minutes, like just stop everything, go lay down, go go fall asleep, and set your alarm for ten minutes. And then when you wake up, because that's the it's the adrenaline spike that actually works, and you don't get a full adrenaline or you don't get the full usage of the coffee. It doesn't work as such unless you go and have a snooze, which I always I always found that uh, you know I was this is about a month ago I was talking to someone about it, 
And um, I found it fascinating because I'm one of those people who will drink coffee and then go to sleep. Yeah. Coffee doesn't yeah. work in the same way. Yeah. I just go to sleep. Yeah, I'm, I'm not know, one so of those people work up if they've had coffee after 9pm or anything like that. No. So that's, that's I might have to try that. Give that a couple of goes. Set, yeah. set a 10 minute alarm and have a bit a quick power nap after I've got up and had a cup of coffee. But I think, yeah, it does yeah. kind of pin you in place. If you have a coffee, you're there for an extra, you're in, I'm still indoors half an hour later if I have coffee. Yeah. Whereas yeah. I'm wondering if tea would have the same effect, so... Yeah, yeah, the Urban Agoge is always evolving. This is the first time anybody's tried yes. to do it for everybody rather than the elite. Mm. Um, just to explain, this is this is the Agoge for everybody else. I mean, in, in ancient Sparta, it was only the elite children that got sent at the age of seven off to military academy. Um, everybody else was just working the fields and stuff. But what happened is the helots every so often would train and then try and overthrow the Spartans. And they came bloody close quite a few times, which is why the Spartans were yeah. so militarily <laughs> um, rigid. You know, they were, they mm. really made their whole culture about being a soldier. <coughs> yeah. So this is the this is the the people's agoge, if you like. So we're we're constantly evolving. If you if you have a little tip or that will get you more functional, then we definitely mm. want to hear it. That's what comments are for. Um, next one on the list is have a tidy environment. And that is... Uh, the one I fail at regularly. Yeah, but I mean, if you're always making the place where you live slightly tidier... Yes, that but does once, help. Once you've made your bed, if you've got clothes all over the floor, you tend to pick them up and put them in the laundry yes. basket. Or... Maybe that's true, actually. That's another thing that does drive me nutty is clothes on the floor. Yeah. It's like I just spent ages washing those. I wash my own clothes, so therefore it's been, it takes me ages to wash my clothes. Yeah. Um, normally. So, you know, I just put mine straight into the washing machine because nearly all my clothes are cotton. Of some yeah, I can't do that because I have to share my house with other people, and yeah. they want to use the washing machine too. Yeah, people normally have, I have to. Normally, I have a day when I can do my washing. Yeah, I mean, I probably do about two washes a week, mainly because now I'm exercising. You know, what I've been exercising in probably needs a wash. Yes, yes. you know, it's quite hard for you to smell how bad you you personally smell because you get used to it. But uh, yeah, true. So a, a tidier environment, you know, it doesn't mean every, yes. you have to take sure. a day and make everything gleamingly tidy. It means you just sort no, of like, but, look, you, know. you should have like clear floors and, you know, even if you were to clear just one surface a day and just go, right, there's yeah, a whole bunch of junk. Every, if you did that every day, then if you, you know, if you spend 10 minutes having a tidy up, then you've got, you know, a clean house after the end of a yeah. month, don't you? Because you've cleaned everything you could possibly clean. And that's something I, I got out of, of all places, the SAS Survival Guide by, by John Wiseman which is a brilliant book. Everybody should own a copy. Um, and he, basically in a survival situation, you should make wherever you're living slightly better every single day. Mm. And in a way of getting yourself off to sleep is to look around where you're camped and say, that could be better. Or I need one of those. Yeah. I need to manufacture X or Y, you know, and that will be yeah. easier. And then the next day you sort of like go, right, I'm going to do this thing. But that's, uh, I know that that sounds like a nag thing, um, some people are tidy and some people aren't. But as you tidy, you tend to n understand yourself, and you need you. You know, there's a a, a mise en. What's it called? Me, mise en place. Mise en place. It's like a know. French thing means a place for everything. Yes. Um, and that's really interesting. You know that. You know it is a. It. I think that sort of came out in the Renaissance where people had lots of crap all over the place people started owning a lot more stuff rather than just the clothes you stood up in and it was mm. it was one of those things that the, the thinkers of the day did and practiced so it doesn't need to be you know you can have the stuff that you need around you all set up you don't have to tidy everything away and go minimalist but being able to find what you no. need as you need it i mean my desk's got a stack of books holding the monitor at, the, at eye height so my head's i don't have monitor stoop because most monitors aren't on stands that are high enough for you not to develop a, a hacker stoop over time. Oh. Yeah, she just reminded me to lift my monitor up because my monitor, my monitor has a stand, but it, it slowly slides down. Yeah, <laughs> I, ju I just I'm constantly having to pick it up again. I just grab a I bunch pick, of. I now pick my monitor up for the for the week. <laughs> books. I mean, hardcover comic books are quite good. An A4 size book. So I just put a stack of those under yeah. it until. I wasn't tilting my head down in order to look at the larger monitor. And I've just got a yeah. box. 
I've got like a little crate with a lid on top and the laptop's on that. And in the crate goes everything I think I'm going to get really annoyed if I don't find. So like my the mail that I've received recently is in there so I can do stuff. And I've got like things like blue tack and a stapler and all that sort of office gubbins is off in, in there. And that's underneath the laptop. So the laptop screen is elevated as well. So I don't have to look down to any of it. But yeah. Um, the one that is the nightmarish one, the one that is hardest to start is exercise every day in some way. Yeah, see, it's funny because I don't think I, that. I think that was one of the easier ones for me because I was so used to taking the dog for a goddamn walk. Yeah, I mean, if you've got an animal you know, that you've got to take, it's for one a of those walk, things that like you don't get a choice. You know, the, you know, the dog has to go for a walk, and if the dog doesn't go for the walk, the dog goes nutty because yeah. the dog's a, she's a border collie. Like she's built to basically herd sheep for the whole day, hmm. and have a drink of water and then go to bed. That's her whole like thing. Hmm. So I don't. Uh, that was probably the easiest one for me, and I and I do. I you know, previously I did walk reasonably regularly. I should, you know, um, yeah. But I think I think for people it is, and I wanted to. I wanted to. Da, 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 da. I go to my my thing here. It's about procrastinating. It's one of those things. The university sends me emails about stuff about mental health all the time. One of those things about avoiding procrastination. I think procrastination. You know. It's all about it's it's all about thing. And I I love that there's like a three page document about procrastinating, and it says the things you need to do are actually like you know six points, yeah. And it's all about studying because it's from university. Mm. Start right now. Set realistic goals. Reward yourself after completing each task with something you love. Mm. Um, study with someone else. Plan your study for a week ahead, and make study and study somewhere different. Yeah. And all of those things, you can obviously change those all into like you know things that work for for, for going for a bloody run. You mm. know, start right now. Well, it's really easy to go for a walk, isn't it? Like you know, no one's asking you to go and like you know run a run an ultra marathon today. Yeah. But you know. Yeah, it's it's an if, absolute if, if bloody you're... nightmare just getting out of the door. You know, when before yeah. you do it. Yeah. I mean, but uh... you but you know, there's the, there is nothing to stop you from just standing up and walking out the door, is there? No. You know. I mean, the, there's a book called The War of Art which is a quite a short audio book. I think it's only about two and a half hours long. And it's all over YouTube. It's well easy to get. Yeah. Um, but the main thrust of it is is that there is a... The guy calls it resistance. And there is a resistance mm. to doing anything worthwhile. You, Your body will... Mm. Because your body's programmed not to make you uselessly burn calories from 50,000 years ago. You know, don't, yeah. don't waste calories. You know, like... Um, yeah. like lions on the serengeti will lie there virtually all day they'll be they'll be mm. quietly processing a load of data and, and seeing if any animal separates itself from the herd or looks ill or is too young and not being looked after and then there'll be a yeah. sudden burst of energy to achieve a very instantaneous result or a kill yes and then it'll all mm. be chilling out and lying around all day and that's great yeah. if, if calories are hard to come by but we yeah, have it's great if you live on the savannah yeah you know, it's <laughs> you know, fantastic or if, you, if you... or if you live in ancient australia yeah then it's great you know but it's rubbish if you know you're eating a type of rice or a type of grain that gives you tons of energy for the amount of effort it takes to obtain it yeah you know and uh yeah so you've got this inertia that's stopping you from getting up and do stuff that do your body doesn't think is important Whereas yeah. for your mind, it is quite important. And if you're going for a walk on your own, obviously maintain a certain amount of personal security. Don't go walking around at three in the morning with headphones on so you're oblivious to any danger that might be around you. But if you're going for a Unless nice... you live in Yakineda. Yeah, when there is nobody. <laughs> or you go in into... In which case, you'll be the only person yeah. around at three o'clock in the morning. But uh, yeah, so if you can listen to headphones... And it's and it's safe for you yeah. to do so. If you're listening to an audio book that's actually telling you something useful, that's quite a good thing to have on mm. while you're walking around. Because while you're exercising, if you're doing a repetitive thing like walking and you're not specifically looking for something, your brain just goes into this mm. sort of like chilled out autopilot and it's much more receptive to new information. So if, if there's something you want to learn, that is a good time to do it, to learn while learn from audio. Because your 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 body's actually giving quite a lot of energy to your hearing and your vision, so your mm. vision is nice and busy because you're trying not to fall over or trip over stuff, and then you can engage the audio audible audio, the auditory part of your brain, is the correct word, in 
learning a, a thing or two while you're out there walking. And I used to walk for miles and miles and miles just processing stuff that was going on in my life. Yeah. And it's always been a good way, you know, if I've had to deal with a complicated issue to go for a very long walk and just let my yeah. brain mull it over. Not even necessarily think about my problems as such, but just let my brain no, just, just... just get out of the door and let yourself Yeah, just think. bimble I mean, about. That's, you know, it's, I, I have to say, it's one of those things my mum actually set me up for because my mum always said that, you know, if you if you felt if you ever felt that way in life and you needed to, needed to go and do something or other, mm. sitting there and doing nothing about it wasn't very good for you and going for a walk was, mm. you know. And, and she would say, uh, you know, she's probably, she probably listening to this. Hi, mum. Um, <laughs> she's still alive and I love her dearly. Um, but she always used to say, like, you know, if you need to, like, you know, you know, tear something, slam a door, and then go for a walk. And you'll feel, ma- you know, maddeningly better after, you know, 15 minutes of going for a walk. Yeah, a lot of this you stuff know. is really embarrassingly straightforward sounding. Yeah, but it's very, it's, it, you know, it, it is it is very straightforward. And I think, but I think we've, you know, to a certain extent, we've lost it because, yeah. you know, TV. Well, there's lots yeah. of distractions. The, you can just plug into the, something. The cult and... of the circus. Yeah, but if you're yeah. if you're taking in audiovisual stimulus from a screen, your brain's got no room to to sort of like wander, float around, and and figure stuff out. There's there's mm. no you don't get a fix at the end of a TV program usually. You just get a like oh now time for another no. television program, now time for yeah, another and, YouTube and, video, and, or and now TV time is for more and, and television is. And yeah, television is just, is designed, as is all social media, that at the end of the thing, you know, you're wondering what's going to happen next. That's why people, you know, that's why Netflix is such a thing. Mm. Because people will literally binge watch what used to take them, you know, the average TV show was, say, 12 weeks long, you know, back in the good old days. Yeah, you, you, know, have to you had to tune in every single week, mm. you know, and watch it at the right time or record it and then watch it back another time. You know, and, and you couldn't really, you know, you had to wait 12 or 13 weeks to get all of the plot bits out and then you could go and watch the whole thing if you wanted to watch the whole thing. Yeah. You know, you could rewatch it. You know, nowadays, you turn on Netflix and you can sit there and watch the whole thing back to back. Yeah. You know. There's even so, a bit where you don't even have and, to watch and, and the And all that happens is, is you sit there watching it for 12 hours, you know, for 12 hours straight, say, mm. you know, and then at the end of it, they've still got exactly the same hook line they had at, at the end of every single episode. What's going to happen in the next series? Yeah. So you're still waiting for that thing to happen. It's just an, just another addictive drug telling you, oh, you've got to wait for, you know, what's going to happen next? What, what's happening in the next series? What's happening next? You know, what's the next part of this story going to be about? Mm. You know, um, you know, this shit is all known by, you know, advertisers and by people who make TV. This is how they make you do things they want you to do. Yeah, it's used in two yeah. ways. It's used these the, all this sort of stuff is used by people that are successful. And in mm. our modern unfortunately in our modern era, successful means making more money than you. You know, if if you're already successful, then you know all this stuff and you probably do it because that's how successful yeah. people function. And I'm not saying you've got to now be a, a a a material success. I'm saying this is how you can succeed in doing the things you want to do. And this, you know, ideally, you know, the people that don't do this would would, you know, like to be more altruistic or to help out other people. And this is what gives you that energy. Weirdly, burning calories gives you energy. Because it preps your body for going, oh, we've got to do stuff now. There's a, a an amazing interview on the Joe Rogan experience where Eddie Izzard is being interviewed after he did all those marathons. And it's just like, yeah. The more energy you burn, the more energy your body is releasing, thinking that you've got a serious situation that you've got to burn energy in. And calories are cheap. Yeah. You know, food in the Western world, at least, is easy to come by and has yes. way more calories than it needs to have. Mm. So we're going to rattle on a little bit through our list a little bit because I've got a couple of pages to go through and I'm about a paragraph in. Um, not having no, we, we always do this the next one is not having tech around you before or after you wake up so if, if you're going to bed don't have don't leave a laptop on or don't have your phone playing stuff necessarily we're, we're going to try a few different things around that but yeah just don't sit in bed and play with your phone go 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 to your bed in order to sleep and the more go you to build, your bed do the thing it's designed to yes, you sleep it's it's not a good place to what you can actually do yourself nerve damage by lying on one side reading a phone and it actually messes mm. with your ocular your your hand eye coordination if you're lying on your side watching something <coughs> so it can do you some real savage damage if you if you sit badly because your bed isn't there's a reason you don't go to work and have a have a bed there instead of a desk 
you know, a bed is not a place to do that sort of stuff. It's it's better to have a machine set up in a different room. And even if you want to just get up and go straight to that laptop because you want to find out if you've got any email, do that. Don't do it in bed. It's a bad idea. Yeah. And don't do it when you wake yeah. up. Just like literally get up, get out of bed. Um, because the longer you stay in bed, the longer you're going to stay in bed. It'll just yes. you'll just be nailed down. And the last bit on my list was was basically what I said at the start: having an evening routine to prep for the next day, mm. and that saves you. Again, you get even more time in the morning. You're getting up early, and all all the stuff you have to do in order to go to work or to do your thing is already done. And I had a, I had a friend a while ago um, that used to set up the breakfast table because him, is, him and his partner would have like this very formal sitting across the breakfast table from each other with a range of condiments and, and marmalade and stuff like that. To me, it, it seemed a little bit um, anal to spend half an hour setting the breakfast table before you went to bed. I'm mean, talking including knives and forks and jam spoons oh, yeah. and a teapot and all this shit. And I would... But don't they... But- do they set? Do they set the reference? Do they set the restaurant for you for the next morning at work? Uh, no. They you might not do they that do it in the morning. But it was ah, just see, weird. We set the re- see. We always set the restaurant. We set the restaurant before anyone is allowed to go home. Like I mean, I, it was proper. Like if when you stay at a hotel and it's a B and B where the, all the all the cereal yeah, boxes like are lined up because you don't know what they don't know what yeah. cereal you want. He'd do that. So it'd be like six <laughs> types of cereal, four types of conserve, marmite, butter. The works would just be set out on if the. I left, if I left the marmite, if I left the marmite and the butter on the table, yeah, the dog you, would eat it. You got nightmare animals, so yeah, so that would happen. But yeah, so it's, it, I used to watch in the kind of weird, should I should I intervene sort of fascination. But yeah, it, it, I don't do that because I make sure that the kitchen work surface is tidy these days. I, I don't know precisely what I'm going to want for breakfast until I wake up. It depends what's there. I'm a very, I'm a very if it put in sort of a person. If it put in, if it's there, you can have it. If it ain't, you can't. You know, you know. So I'll get up and look at the fridge until the images coalesce, and I can come up with something useful to have for breakfast. So yeah, um, so that's the the sort of like the habits thing, and the habit will form in as little as two weeks, and it's a pain mm. for those first two weeks because you're having to consciously do it. You know, in a kind of future me will will thank me. You know, if I do this for two weeks and I d- it then becomes a habit, then that's so much time saved that you've got to yeah. do. You know, you've 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 basically earned a whole bunch of extra time because, mm. from personal experience, if you put all your shit together in the morning in order to leave the house, the odds are fairly good that you'll forget something. Whereas if you set it up the yeah. night before and you get into a routine of doing it, then you don't have to think about it. It's just already there. Like already, I'm working at midday tomorrow. My uniform for tomorrow, most of my lunch for tomorrow, all the other stuff is already in there. Yeah, you know everything I'll need for work is in the bag. Everything that I need to charge is being charged, and it's on mm. my desk right now. So everything will be at hundred percent. All my stuff's in my bag. Mm. So yeah, that's the the habits section. And what was the guy? I can't remember the guy's name, but he did. There was a a, a book called psycho cybernetics as in treating your mind like a machine and programming as such written in the 1960s by a plastic surgeon who watched people have to deal with new things all the time i wouldn't say necessarily the book is a really great thing but he talked about habits and brain chemistry and that which is our next thing was it was it maltz yep that's the guy m-a-l-t-z maxwell maltz um, in the first few episodes of Urban and Gogo, I talk about him quite a bit because I kept finding stuff that he'd come up with that I was applying directly. And I found out about the brain chemistry thing and the habits thing separately. And it was like, that can't be the same guy. That's too useful. But it, it, he was an interesting guy, you know. Mm. And he was a plastic surgeon that dealt with a lot of people that had lost limbs or had facial reconstruction surgery. When he said it could take anything up to six months to get into the habit of, say, looking at a new face in the mirror or dealing with a lost limb. But it does eventually become yeah. very habitual. So I'm hoping that applies to stopping smoking. But I'm not going to inflict that on my work colleagues. I'm going to have a week off and quit smoking then and replace it with some other habit because that's just, no, there's no need for that. So on that subject, the brain chemistry that he was talking about, there's four main chemicals that sort of like deal with everything. Um 
you know that basically are the reasons you do everything and if you know if you're listening to this you're a smart and attractive human being that can work all this out from what i'm going to talk about so i've created a, like an acronym from it dose d-o-s-e so the first one is dopamine which is your, your chemical and reward you know if you do if you plan to do something and then you do it you have this sort of sense of satisfaction um and that's what you get so if say if you saw fruit in a tree and you made a plan to climb the tree then you climb the tree and then you're eating the fruit you get like doubly satisfied than if somebody else climbed the tree and brought f fruit to you when you make a whole plan and it all comes off and you know you're being rewarded with dopamine for planning basically just even if you're just making a plan to do something you get a dopamine hit and when you do that plan and it's all sorted out you get another one so we're programmed to sort of come up with creative solutions for a start the most dangerous one um and the one that's been replicated in some fairly dangerous opiate drugs is oxytocin which is which i would refer to as a social chemical and you get it from positive social interaction with people and feeling included that's why a lot of people turn to drugs that replicate you know downer type drugs that replicate the fuzzy feeling you get when you're accepted as part of a group that's why if you're with a bunch of friends you don't drink as much as as if you're with a bunch of people that you don't know as well because it's it's like a like almost like an opioid hit when you have alcohol it it calms you down and makes you feel more accepted so yeah and you can dangerous in the wrong hands you can you can play with that you know even if you don't you don't give a shit about people you can you can, if you pass someone you say good morning they'll say good morning back and you both get a hit of dopamine and the mad thing is if someone witnesses you saying good morning but isn't close enough to say good morning as well that person witnessing people being nice to each other will also get a, a hit of oxytocin so you just get this feedback loop of, of feeling included which is why when you're being bullied and excluded you have an oxytocin dip that makes you depressed mm. you know if you feel excluded from society you're more likely to drink or smoke cannabis or anything that's a downer to sort of like just chill you out which is the feeling that you get when you're included in a group that's why people drink a lot at family christmas dinners <laughs> <laughs> um serotonin is the satisfaction chemical that you get a a, a, a chunk of, a little dose of when um you've finished a meal and it's yep. also the the sensation you're feeling post coitally which is why if you're again if if you're feeling excluded or you you you're not getting laid a lot you will feel a serotonin drop and a lot of that's what it does it to rep replicate that you can it, you can be uh, like at risk of overeating quite heavily so you you oh. can you can eat yourself out of loneliness but the downside of that is that overeating will kill you eventually so you know it's a, the the satisfaction chemical you know also um if you do something that's vigorous you've planned for it and you've you've helped out somebody socially you'll get a, another serotonin hit mm. because you've 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 achieved what you set out to do and you're you're you know especially if you've eaten something and you can now chill out and you're you've got no more plans you'll get a serotonin boost so actually one of the things you can do to get around that loneliness feeling is to go and do something that's why if you're active or you've got a project to do or you've got something to do you don't feel excluded and you don't you don't sort of like put you know let's put this bluntly guys you don't masturbate as much if you've got things to do yes if you haven't got anything yeah. to do you'll probably masturbate more and then you'll feel an oxytocin dip because you're on your own you know so yeah. it's, a, it's a really vicious feedback loop that's trying to make you make more small humans so you, you can game all this. And the final one's endorphin, which is an anti-pain chemical, which again is exploited by drug companies. Um, and if you exert yourself and you you it'll make you forget minor injuries like scratches or bruises, and it'll give you enough energy to over exert yourself in order to run away from a predator, for instance. You know, it's, a, it's that's a really interesting, but it's basically those four chemicals are the reason your emotions spike and dip all the time that's it mm. so all those times when people have done some mad level evil shit those are the four chemicals that have been responsible in micrograms of doses 
which is why people that have a good family life and feel accepted and have things to do and are interested in stuff and, and you know, basically getting everything they need, those people don't tend to start wars or genocide or shit like that. You've got to be deficient in one of those forward brain chemicals to do mean shit to other humans. You know, so that that's basically how the world works, explained by four chemicals in an acronym. So you can actually stop people from doing evil shit by being nice to them, which is <laughs> because people are experiencing oxytocin dip, so they yeah. they overcompensate so with the other problem. chemicals. So if you're just nice to them, yes. say, I've I've broken up domestic rows by offering both of them a coffee. <laughs> So like people are screaming at each other at two o'clock in the morning you get up and go do you guys want a coffee and they're like what like you haven't shouted at them <laughs> so you haven't made them defensive or you haven't given them the oxytocin yes, you, boost just changed, that these two people are now the, facing you against the, parlor, the threat yeah. i've just completely brain melted them i'm going do you want a coffee you seem yeah. very angry and you know like <laughs> if we all have something in common like having a coffee then we might all chill out a bit you know yeah. And it does totally derails people if you're nice to them when they want to be angry with you. So you can, comp you know, you don't have to be subservient, but you can sort of do things like say, oh, I understand where you're coming from. That must be very aggravating. And then they get an oxytocin hit, which completely derails their anger. It's it's a very yes. mean thing to uh, do. Amazing, it's, amazing. It's, it's, it's borderline sociopath behavior, but it's fun to do. Because it's really hard to be angry with someone that's being nice to you. So it's next to impossible. Because your ability to maintain your fight or flight response, which is giving you the adrenal boost that will allow you to do violence, you know, and the endorphin hit that will allow you to ignore the pain of doing that violence. It's very hard to, to injure someone with your bare hands and not get hurt. This is rule yeah. number one of fighting. You are going to get hurt. Even if nobody lands a punch, your knuckles are going to really, really hurt. But yeah, there's a few tips for you. I mean, don't do it if you're if you you know if if it's if it's really super violent. But that's one of one of the reasons why police officers used to go hello hello hello. <laughs> and evening all that was police training. People, you know, the whole Dixon yeah. and Doc Green evening all Change. type thing was a kind of like it's really hard to 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 like launch into a you know if someone's been politely introducing themselves to you and said look I'm here don't jump or anything. But, you know, you might want to reconsider your current, you know, course of action. And, it, you know, it's it, it's a thing I miss about the police. They should do that more. Mm. You know, I mean, the, the, some police do do it and are, and are super friendly. You know, if you are yeah. super friendly, it's much harder. I mean, you're always going to come across the one sociopath that's just going to see you as a threat no matter what you say. But for the most part... Yeah, but for the most know, part, it changes everyone else's... People find it amazingly day, difficult. doesn't it? You know, and, yeah. and weirdly, dogs are the same. If you've got a, like a nervous looking dog and you look directly at the dog and say hello in the, that, that way you speak to small children, dogs get, even if they're feeling very nervous, get a little bit confused long enough for them to calm down. Yeah. It's like, that's why I always say to a dog that's sort of like growling at me, I just go, really? And the dog's like, oh. <laughs> horses are the same. If, horse, if horses move aggressively towards you, you just speak softly to them and just go, there's no need for that. And that calms you and them down and you both get an oxytocin hit because it's a mammal thing rather yeah. than just a human thing. But yeah, weird shit you can do if you want to mess with people. <laughs> but the good, the cool thing about being nice to someone and is mess you, with yourself. you still get an oxytocin hit even though you're not feeling like you want to be nice to them. If you're nice to them, you get this social chemical thing where you're just like, oh, you, your brain just gets a little bit confused and gives you an oxytocin hit just on the off chance. It's very strange. I have been trying it out on my colleagues at work. It's made them very nervous because you used to be a lot grumpier in the kitchen. Weirdly enough, it's made them grumpier with each other. And I don't know why. Me being nicer seems to have escalated their grumpiness with each other and they're far more aggressive with one another. And I'm wandering around like the Buddha going, chill out, peeps. But it's uh, you know, purely from a self-serving point of view. And I know some of them are subscribers, so they're going to have a good laugh about that. Um... I suppose we better rattle on. We're nearly at an hour. We might go over an hour for the first podcast because we've got a lot to get through. Um, if you're up for that, have you still got a little bit of time? I'm fine for that. Okay. So um, the next thing, I, I then had a look at a, a really famous book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, 
which is an interesting, interesting book. And it's designed for business leaders and stuff like all these self-help books that actually get you doing stuff are designed for people that, you know, are important executives. You know, it's the the, the elite agoge rather than the urban one. And he had some really interesting points. I've not read all of the book yet. I just like lifted the bits that I could use quickly. And aggravatingly, this is one of those self-help books that, although it pontificates about it, um, is, is generally right. I don't know if you've listened to it or read it. No, I haven't. No, I've got to get just, around to doing cribbed, it. I just cribbed your notes. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I took from it. And there, there's a few other bits in it. It's got, if you can't be bothered to read the book, there's a very good Wikipedia page about it. And I've tried to start listening to it, but it does drag on. Because I think it's in, it's, it's like it's 100th reprint or something. I think it was brought out in 1980. And it's just been a bestseller. It was brought out in 89. It's mm. 381 pages long. Mm. Um, which tells you something about, you know, about, about how, how much the person wanted to write a book rather it's, than write down the seven things. That you oh, yeah. To well, you can't just walk around helping people. They'll nail you to a bit of wood. Yes, that is true. You know, it's, yeah, like, you know, it's you a really a book. dangerous thing to do to help people in a non-secular way. And if yeah. and if you if you don't make a whole book out of it, nobody will give you any money. If you just tell people stuff. Mm. I mean, now we're in the age of the internet. If Stephen Covey was writing today and he just did a thing like, okay... Well, they, well, this is, you know, the it's, it's hard because, I mean, it's it's such a short list of stuff. I mean, there are even YouTube videos that summarise the book in 10 minutes, which is what I first watched before I started trying to listen to it as an audio book. So he, you know, he started off with these seven things that really work. And I've talked about it in, in, in at least one video, and I've referenced back to it in at least two or three because I've noticed myself doing as quite a lot of this stuff in one activity so they're sort of be proactive as in don't always be on the back foot don't let life dictate the pace of events and that's also military strategy you don't let the enemy dictate the course of actions so you know decide that you're going to be the person that makes the change or makes the action rather than be the person that reacts to things all the time because if anybody's worked in telemarketing you'll know how shit that feels I bet he's gone out. He's bet he's gone and let the dog out. Are you there? No, I haven't. All oh, right. So, <laughs> so yeah. So be active rather than reactive is pretty much that. I hate the word proactive because I've been in too many telephone call centre jobs where they start sort too of many like proactive yeah, meetings. Yeah, too many, too much synergising of the dynamism and all that sort of shit. Managing. <laughs> haven't got there yet. Come on. Oh no. Begin with the end in mind. You know, if you're ever in one of those meetings where they're telling you that you've got to work harder. And they're using bullshit words like this. And you think it's bullshit. It probably is. Yes. You know, there's a good chance that the person hosting the meeting telling you you've all got to work harder for some random bullshit reason doesn't actually know what's going on. I mean, don't tell them that because that's a bit like, you know, you know, trying to, you know, you might as well get your own wood and your own nails and choose your own time and place of crucifixion rather than let someone else do it. But they don't like it. I can tell you that from now. I've been in enough meetings where I've been thrown out. Of a, of a team meeting because I've gone that's not true anyway so be proactive you know sort of where you can and where it's sensible to be the person that takes action and if you're it doesn't matter if you've got a crappy job if you're in the rest of your time doing something active that you're choosing to do you'll feel a lot better about it. you'll be able to take a lot more of the uh, systematic mind fuckery that goes with working in a boring job mm. Um, unless you're doing something so boring that no one wants to do it and then they tend to leave you alone. That's why a lot of your great thinkers have been dishwashers, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Hmm. You know, there is there is still, but to quote Heinlein, there is still room in the world for someone who has to count the spikes on a blind person who is disabled, who has to count the spikes on the back of a caterpillar on, on Ganymede. Yep. You know, you know, there's, there's a place for everyone and, and it does work. Yeah. But yeah, be proactive. Um, go on, continue. Okay, and the next one was begin with the end in mind. So there's no point starting something unless you know what the possible finish might be, or at least a, a, a first goal. You can add, you can add what yep. they call stretch goals. You can, like we're doing the army fitness course. You know, on the days you do it, it's getting a lot easier to go do it. But you, mm. at least with, there is an end. You know, you know, fourteen, twelve, sixteen weeks after you start, it's done. 
and then you can your stretch yeah. goal can be right. I want to maintain this level of fitness, or I want to compete with myself. Yeah, I want to or, get or faster. you know, what do you want to do after you've done that thing? You know, what are you, what are you looking towards doing after that? Yeah. Is also a, a valid thing to do. I, you, may not, you may not know the answer to that. I definitely want to do a martial art because I've never yeah. done a martial art with the aim of of progressing in it. I did. A, I, yeah. I I don't know why I was doing judo when I was a teenager, but I never I never ever went for it to get another belt. I never went and did the great. I did judo when I was a teenager, so I could learn to fall over. Hmm. I enjoyed I enjoyed doing judo, so I learned to fall over. Yeah, it was, I had to do I had to do something for school sport, and judo came up, and I was like, oh, this is interesting, so I did that. Hmm. You know, and so you know, have a plan. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, when you start something, you go right. I'm going to do this thing. How long is it going to take you? What's it going to look like when it's done? You know, have an idea of hmm. how it's going to uh, turn out, and that's that's always marvelously concentrating. So you got you got something to aim for. Which again is pretty commonplace advice. The third one was yeah. put first things first. It's like actually structure how you're going to start doing it, so that you're not, yes. you don't sort of like then it's it's to stop the 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 sort of resistance of getting something done. You know, if if you if you do if you put everything together in order and you build a proper foundation for the thing that you're going to done, you assemble the tools you need to do a job. It's a lot easier yeah. and you get done a lot quicker. Which again is another aggravating thing. If you, thing go, because if you go, if you go look at the um, at the Wikipedia page, they've actually gone gone and stolen the matrix of importance versus urgency, which is actually quite useful if you go and like actually go and do something. Yeah, you know, you know that's all of a... all of the other th- you know, there's there's the box that says there's a box the, the third quadrant says urgent but not important. It says you should mm. delegate those things, and I don't have any to delegate to, so that sort of goes out the window. It's the sort of thing where if somebody was telling me that on a stage. I would like to be up in the rafters with a sniper rifle and be able to call that person <laughs> and just go, Stephen. Delegate this. I'm in the yes. rafters with a sniper anyway. rifle. I planned my mission carefully, <laughs> like you said. I put the bullets together. I their hand loads. I planned them meticulously. I learned how to hand load bullets. I've spent four years being an expert marksman just for this moment. I put everything in the right order. I dynamized my matrix of importance. I hope you're happy. I hate it when people do that. When they just go, now we're going to give you five long words when three short ones would have done. Yes, He's already yes. nutshelled it. Do it in that order. Mm. You don't need to add longer yeah. words and then spend Lots ten paragraphs words. explaining those words. What a waste of time. It's a waste of my time. Yeah. If someone's doing something that you're paying money for and they're, you know, they're setting out to waste more of your time, that's almost insulting. That's my time. I had other shit yes. to do. I'm not reading your book so I can say I've read a book. It's like when people talk endlessly about computers. It's a tool. It's like being an expert on power drills. Well, that's all very well and good, but I want to put holes in things. You know, and after your explanation of how the motor works and whether the the Black & Decker 15,000 hammer drill is better than the 16,000 hammer drill because of its screwless chuck and all that, no. It's a tool. You know, I'm reading this book so I can do other shit that's more interesting in a more efficient way. Oh, it pisses me off. There, there again, none of you, thankfully, have having to, had to listen to as many self-help books as I've listened to in the last month. I've listened to a bunch. Um, the next one is Think Win-Win. Um, I think I've nailed that with the whole Urban Agoge thing, because if nobody ever listens to it, I'm still, you know, dynamised and, 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 and going for it. I've, I've learned a lot of stuff in the last month. So, yeah, if, if, you can, if you can figure out a way where you get a double win out of doing something, then that's great. You know, if you think of as many ways that this benefits you, that, that what you're doing benefits you, that's awesome. And it does give you, a, a, it does give you like uh, one of those big dopamine hits when you just think, right, I needed a table, but I bought too much lumber and now I've made two tables and I've just sold one of the tables to someone, you know, that I built out the spare materials and they've paid me more money than it cost me to buy the materials. So I got a free table. That's a win-win situation. You know, it, it really does work pretty good. You know, if you can get yeah. that sort of double win out of something. So, like, if you're thinking about writing a book and you say, right, I'm writing a book. If it sells, I'll make money. But I will have written a book. You know, I've, I've still got that goal achieved and then I made money from achieving that goal type thing. It's pretty cool. So, I, I don't know. Yeah. 
I, I, I've I've always been like that. You know, if I can if I can get a double win out of stuff, then it's like woo. Double win. It, it yeah. makes sense, doesn't it? You know, yeah, it, if, it, it you know goes back to all the rain chemistry stuff. Yeah. Makes perfect and sense. if you're thinking about doing something creative, and then you're out on your walk, and you figure that it's going to be another benefit, you'll get that dopamine hit. I mean, getting the dopamine hit by doing something is also a win-win. It's like I've done the washing up and I've got my dopamine hit and now it's not haunting me. That's a triple win, really. So, you know, you can always do it and it does always make you feel better. But it allows you to maybe not make one of those wins. You know, you you get victory, What, what you know, by doing this thing, whatever happens. You know, if you do the washing up and nobody appreciates it, for instance, then it's still a win because that job's out of the way. If somebody then appreciates it, then you get your double dopamine hit and an oxytocin hit through someone thanking you for doing something. Oh, yeah. It, it goes on and on. You can really spiral on this shit. Mm. Um, next one up on the list was seek first to understand and then to be understood, which is a really good mantra. And just yeah. saying that really chills people the fuck out if you're explaining something badly. <laughs> you can just say... Uh, I see. And it makes you sound all yodery. But it is a good idea to understand what it is you want to say, to fully understand it, and then think about a way of explaining it to someone so they can get it. Which is kind of like the whole Urban Agoge thing in a, in, a, in a sentence. That's it. We're done. We're done with the Urban Agoge. There Jake. it is. It's just no more. Um, the next one is a terrible word. Synergize. Oh, come on. It's a great word. Oh, it's terrible. It's not as bad as monetize to actually monetize your <laughs> synergy, which is like a that's management speak bullshit bingo. That you should get a whole line for that. You should, as soon as somebody says synergize in a room, you should grab your management bullshit speak bingo card and jump to your feet and scream bingo, thus confusing the person hosting the meeting. But it means just be, basically <laughs> where you can work with other people. Because yeah. other people will come up with great combine, ideas yeah, as well. Strengths, it combines strengths yeah. and do positive things with, with, within the team. One person you know. can be capable, but two, pe two capable people is a force multiplier. Mm. Two capable people are worth easily 20 stupid people. Yeah, Easily. Two capable I mean, look at the state of the world is in right now. That's capable people going, oh, sh screw this. I'm not living in the, with the same living standards as you lot. I'm doing all the thinking. Mm. And that's that's how you get a small group of people being able to take over a whole country. I mean, Lenin was in exile when the the October Revolution happened, yeah. but he'd managed to inspire enough people that it just kicked off while he was in exile. He had to he had mm. to really, you know, travel some to get back in time to be part of the the first Russian Revolution. But that's because he had like a few people working with him, and those few people were enough yeah. to tip the balance. But that. The Russian Revolution was a room full of people. A room full of people. I mean, look mm. how big Russia is. It's always had a massive population and a room full of people completely changed the paradigm. Change it, yeah. So that's work, you know, work with people. And the third one is kind of what we're doing with the physical side of it. Sharpen the saw. Mm. Yeah. You know. Which it, I, I found that interesting because it comes back to the toy. It's like Kaizen, which is a Japanese word meaning like improvement, mm. you know. Um, yeah, that's uh, and it does it. You know, it's it's misrepresented as being like you know continuous improvement. It just means to like improve for the betterment. Yeah, just improve by increments. Um, and was... it was it was organised by the guys that like the people, the managerial team, managerial approach with production system was first used at Toyota Motor Corporation yeah. after um, after World War Two. It was how they changed um, how they changed to like lean processing all that sort of stuff, which is all like amazing. If you if you ever study, I'd studied engineering for years and years and years now. Yeah, and um, and it's one of those things that comes up again and again and again in engineering is this methodologies in, in, in lean manufacturing and how to reduce waste and all the rest because that's how you make money in engineering. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, which is pretty cool. in some ways it can be bad news but, for it, workers. Like it, it, yeah, but it, it, can be, it can be absolutely murderous for workers, but it can be if, if approached correctly by, you know, it's, it's supposed to be movement towards a better thing for everyone. And yeah. it's often not done that way. No. You know, it's obviously an impo it's obviously an imposed thing, and that's a negative. That's not kaizen. They're big not, on doing not, it right you know. in places like Germany and Japan, where efficient, yeah. efficiency is not only prized but it's praised by the management. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know. if you look at somewhere like Amazon, Amazon has a burnout yeah. rate of about nine months. Yeah, like you can work at Amazon and you can meet 
though their requirements that which they've used the lean methodology which is an evolution of kaizen but they they yeah. have missed the boat really because they don't really hmm. seem to think that experienced employees are a good idea because at 12 months you get your you're on probation for a year at amazon so yeah. they'll burn you out before you even get any of the long-term benefits of being an amazon employee and a lot of middle yeah, managers cause... in my experience tend to misunderstand kaizen and try yeah. and misapply it to things which are not repetitive tasks so yeah. I've had people try and explain lean to me when I worked in a call center. And I just said, the reason you have people answering the telephones is you need a person's perspective and you can't tell me that my phone call should be yeah, exactly 10 minutes long in order for me to be an yeah. efficient employee. That person might need more help mm. than 10 minutes. Do you, want, yeah. do you want me to cut them off at 10 minutes? Because that really yeah. isn't going to help either because they're going to be really pissed off when they phone back. Mm. You know, you, there there are some middle management people that have literally got to middle middle management by dint of being an employee for long enough that they yes. they can't they not be promoted, early. and they they're kind of useless. Yes. And th every telephone job that I've ever been involved with has tried to espouse lean to me, mm. and I have tried to explain to them that this is a creative process rather than a manufacturing process, and that a lot of them don't get it. They, they they go to one seminar about Kaizen and Lean and completely miss it. But that's part of your mm. being proactive in your own life so you can put up with more of that yeah. bullshit. Just tune it out. This is my advice to you. Tune it out. And if necessary, um, allow their new methodology to fail on its own. You know, just let them fail. Mm. Don't try and fix it because generally those people can't be told. But yeah, yeah, they have to be, have to be allowed to have to be allowed to seek their own thing. And this is this this urban agoga is not to make you a more productive worker; it's to make you a more a happier and more capable and more creative human being. Human. So this is not for your management's yeah. consumption. So the sharp and the saw thing is the tool that you have, the tools that you want to use should be in the best possible condition. So I've taken that to mean be fitter, you know, be better yeah. nourished, be better be better exercised, be more capable, be happier, and then you'll be able to do more stuff that means something to you, whether that's right. As a book. we would say in Australia, as we'd say in Australia, be more deadly. Mm. You, know. you know, you're the most dangerous creature on the planet. Keep it that way for as long as possible. Yeah. You know, and even when you're in your 80s, be Mr. Miyagi. Don't be, you know, Albert Steptoe. You know, <laughs> be, be, be bloody dangerous. Be creative. Be ready for when that, that life-changing opportunity steps up and be like, right, I saw that. Boom. In like Flint. You know, go for it. But yeah, so those were really, that really spoke to me once I distilled it into those seven points and then tried to mm. fold those in and go, right, with this new overlay of understanding, how am I doing my job? You know, so that led me to the whole five five ways of telling people for that seek first to understand, then to be understood. And I really believe that if I, I I used to get annoyed if I had to tell someone how to do something twice. Now I now I tell a story or I say a why. You know, yeah. why why might it benefit you not to piss me off and to understand why this is interesting and you should do it this way. Mm. You know, so. Th that that seems to be working even on the most ditzy of, of the people I have to work with that seems to work you know I'll try five or six ways to explain it and see if I can't find a way that it might be beneficial to that person to do what it is I want them to do yeah I'm only trying to do things in the most organized and logical way possible I'm not you know seeking to form a cult of my co-workers I just want them to do shit that <laughs> means that I don't stress about it not being efficient so as you know, explain it a couple of different ways. But it, those were seven sailing points. I've now got that up on, above my my computer monitor, so it's in my eye line. Mm. So it's, it's it's a good those seven things, and I'll be uploading the document and the audio from this recording up onto archive.org, and there'll be a link on the video in case you want to have it yeah. as something to listen to when you're out doing your walk or something. So you've got yeah. possibly two hours worth of stuff to listen to. <laughs> If you're going for your half hour walk that's a week of uh things to think about the listings mm. and then we move to dietary changes and harlequin's always been like way further ahead of me on the dietary shit 
ever since I've known you, you've had a better diet than I have. And it wasn't until I... like eating food. Yeah, but you've always eaten much more healthily than me. Yeah, I think I like eating good food. Yeah. I think think it's a childhood thing for me. We were talking about yesterday, last night, my time, we were talking about sort of how... Um, how rationing and things affected, um, how rationing affected children in the UK, and also how the um, it was the thing about overweightedness in. Sorry, there's something filthy on my screen, which is annoying me. Um, and how um, uh, obesity, the obesity epidemic. I think it was in. I think it was Denmark. Someone will correct me. I think it was Denmark after World War Two. It was the subsequent two generations after World War Two because of the starvation rations that um, people from Denmark were put on. Hmm. That then their children and their children's children were actually um, obese by. You know, they were basically more prone to be obese um, just because of what they'd been put through. Yeah, because their parents um, were determined that they wouldn't go hungry and then you overcompensate. They wouldn't go hungry. So they, they made sure they didn't go hungry. Yeah. Um, it's a weird... Yeah, so I guess, I guess you know, it's, it, I, I, you know, the only thing we have basically... You know, we've, we've been searching quite... quite I've, I've been looking and looking and looking for trying to find more and more useful things to say. But it literally comes down to eat less crap being... Crap being carbonated, refined, artificial or processed. And then eat more food, which are basically fruit and vegetables, lean organic protein, omega-3 fatty acids, and drink more water. Yeah. So it's a nice little acronym. Don't eat crap, eat food. Yeah. And if you and if you can and if you can stop eating the crap, um, and start eating the food, which is I you know I I fully admit that this is very difficult in the modern world because there's so much shit, you know. Yeah. Like I I go to I work in a restaurant too, and it's just like everything on the menu is just, you know, crap. horrendous. It's like you, you horrendous at, crap. Yeah, you know, it, it's 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 not in. It's it's just overdone because restaurants have to stand out from one another. You're now, you know, I yeah, think so they have to. You know, the restaurants have to stand out from one another. So they have to have the sweetest, the most colourful, the most you know, the most ornate thing. Yeah, you know, that is probably the most processed to stand out in front of everyone else and and have a restaurant. You know? Yeah, or as Dara O'Brien says, by. where did all this bloody pulled pork come from? Yeah. You know, it's just, and you know, I've I've always been annoyed by the um, the second. Uh, uh, it's not adverb; it's uh, adjective on food. So you can't have salt and vinegar crisps anymore. It's got to be sea salt and balsamic vinegar. Despite <laughs> the fact it's not balsamic vinegar, I'm telling you from now, it's still acetic acid. Uh, uh, that acid that vinegar's made of. Yeah, acetic acid. Yeah. Uh, and salt. You know, everything's got to have another another adjective added onto it. So it's now got to be honey glazed ribs instead of ribs. So that you know, and Cory Doctorow had a big rant about International House of Pancakes IHOP in America, and he said basically you can spend four dollars and get an adult sized plate of candy. There's That's so much makers for anyone who wants to go and read it. Makers is a brilliant Make, book. makers. The ma- the whole of makers is basically basically him taking a stab at IHOP. That are causing obesity. Yeah, and it and it deals with obesity in really weird sci-fi ways. It's a lot more sci-fi than it seems initially, but it's it's yeah. very interesting. As is Walk Away, you know, definitely worth. Mm. Both of those books are definitely worth a read, and they're probably findable if you're the per- sort of person, as I said in an earlier video, that finds things on the internet. If you find things, then you should listen to them. So yeah, it's sort of like less carbonated drinks, less refined sugar, less artificial sweeteners and colours and less processed food, which is a lot of stuff. That's like, you go into a supermarket, that's 90% of everything they have here. I was, well, yeah, I was thinking about it the other day and I was like, you know, what, what, you know, I was wandering around the supermarket going like, you know, what can you actually eat if you, if you observe these rules? Yeah, it's, it's right. slashed my and food it, budget. It's things, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's things that have, you can actually, you can, pretty much you can sum it up if you want an easy way of thinking about it is, is things that have a single ingredient. Yeah. So if you walk around the supermarket and you find something that has a single ingredient, like a beetroot is a single mm. ingredient. Yeah. Water is a single ingredient. Oats. Yeah. But honey. no sugary drink is ever a single ingredient. Yeah. You know. It's a long, yeah. long list in very small print. It's a long, long list. Like, Even most things that are considered to be juice are not a single ingredient. No. And I, but an orange is. The thing that pisses me off about commercially available smoothies is the fact that they're filtered. So there's no bits. Mm. We need the bits in a smoothie. You need <laughs> the, the fiber. The that actually make it yeah. food. If you strain all the fiber out, it's uh, still sugary water. Mm. Uh, you know, it's like get used to bits in your teeth. 
you know if you've got bits in your teeth after you've had a smoothie that's right now have another have a glass of water to go with it get all the bits out your teeth but yeah it should have fiber in it it should be thick if you can pour it through a sieve it ain't a smoothie you know a smoothie should be one lump or two it should be like basically a fruit milkshake with all the stuff in it and the food thing I'm just going to explain this a little bit because when I set, saw a couple of the things in there, the first, the first and last one, fruit and veg, you can't really eat enough of that. You know, I mean, you probably could. You could probably get a beast and eat fruit and veg, but you'd have to be really going some. Your, I think your <laughs> your 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 um, intestines nice. would sort you out. I mean, basically, you, you'd spend the day on the loo. If you eat too much fruit, you know, take something to read with you to the toilet. Because you're going to be there for a while. Um, but the organic lean protein, I had to look up what that meant. So things like if you if you eat meat, turkey and chicken, um, beans and lentils, uh, fish, shellfish and eggs. Eggs eggs wasn't listed on the organic lean protein, but it is there. You know, if you're a vegetarian, then eggs are probably you know hard boiled eggs is an amazing breakfast. If you can yeah. if you can bother to make it and fish. I'm not too big on shellfish because they you know if you get the timing on those wrong that can kill you. There's a reason there's a reason yes, my, my, Christians there's don't a reason why large large groups of of religious people do well, not eat such shellfish. Basically any old testament based religion so that's Judaism, Islam and Christianity all say shellfish is a bad idea because they're all using yeah. the same book. Because they notice that if you shipped shellfish a couple of days inland and gave them to people they died like pork yes. it's also, if you it's kill a pig and wait that, a couple um, of days my... it's gonna kill you if you don't preserve yeah, it's it. also the fact that um it's also the fact that if you that because of what shellfish eat as in they're all water water filters yeah, they essentially you know sewage. what they eat they're, you're essentially eating eating something that is eaten you know all the debris off the bottom of the ground of, yeah. the, of the ocean and the of the typically sea. speaking prawns tend to like living around the outlet pipes of sewage systems into that go into the ocean yeah, which is not overly yeah. good so I can see, you know, a lot of the dietary requirements of, of your your older religions um, are pretty sensible. You know, pork mm. will kill you if you get it wrong. F shellfish will kill you if you get it wrong. I mean, fish, you don't want to eat if you've got it wrong, but you can't always tell with shellfish and oysters and prawns and stuff. Mm. But nobody can go wrong with a hard-boiled egg. They're probably the safest thing to eat in the world. Because it hasn't been opened, it hasn't been the the stuff that you're going to eat hasn't been opened to the environment, and it's boiled, so it's been exposed to temperature that kills all known bacteria, or at least the ones you're likely to come in contact with. So if you're ever travelling abroad, and you're going somewhere where the water is different, and you're not sure of the food, or you're thinking that this the spiciness of the food or how they eat it is going to give you an upset stomach, hard boiled eggs are going to keep you alive. You can eat, mm. you don't want to eat too many of those. And you probably want to stop at about three a day if that's what you're exclusively eating. Or you're trying to eat only packaged foods, but hard-boiled eggs will keep you alive pretty much. And the omega-3 fatty acids are mostly found in fish oil, almonds, pecans, walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, which wasn't on my list, and olive oil. So if you only use a little bit of cooking oil, say to cook rice, olive oil is a good, a good oil to cook those in. So you're getting that little fix of, of that thing that you need. Because those things, fruit and vegetables, organic lean protein and omega-3 fatty acids, if you focus your diet on that, that's a balanced diet. <clears throat> and, if you, and, if, and if you aren't a vegetarian, salmon is probably the best source of protein on earth for some reason. There isn't anything that's got more protein in it than salmon. And wild salmon at that, not farmed salmon. For some reason, wild salmon have got a lot more protein because of, they've got much better Ooh. worked muscles. And drink more water. It's always good. I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with this drinking two litres of water a day exclusively because you can actually cause liver damage by drinking exclusively water, which is weird. You can drink too much water. So if you'll you'll find you're yeah, drinking... Some weird, I don't know like, what it's called. There is some weird thing where It's also a sign of, water. of early onset diabetes. So if you're drinking four yeah. litres of water a day and you're drinking other drinks and eating, then you need to... You need to, you know, possibly get that checked out. Um, the other thing I have learned in the last few weeks is portion control. So if you make a fist, that's how big your stomach is. You know, try not to eat more than that in any one meal. So 
what I would recommend is is if you're going to start cutting down on your food and you're going to do exercise um, get yourself like a, a smallish cereal bowl and that will be about the right size for a portion of food and if you eat more than that you actually get a distended stomach and you get you do get um, um, a serotonin hit from overeating but that's largely to stop you eating before you hurt yourself internally so you know a, f a small bowl of food is generally where it's at as far as how much you should eat so that could be a steak and a few chips and some vegetables would all fit in that bowl if you squished it down or rice and curry that would fit in that bowl that would absolutely fill it or cereal or whatever you're going to eat and it tends to be cheaper I mean to be fair I went out and spent 30 quid on groceries today but I was buying stuff like honey which is expensive and cat food which is more expensive than my than my week's actual intake of food I think the cat food, the next few weeks of cat food she she outspent me in food um so you know I got things like uh, zero fat yogurt because you get fat from all sorts of other places you, you know but yogurt is is um another one of those uh organic lean proteins so low fat dairy is in one of those so if you just if you have some low fat yogurt that will give you that lean protein unless you're vegan in which case I don't know if you can make yogurt out of almond milk I'm not sure I think I would have heard about it coconut milk coconut ah. milk yogurt can, does that taste and of also coconut milk yogurt Did... uh, people say it does I don't think it does I can't I don't drink a lot of milk because I can't drink milk because I'm lactose intolerant alright um, so I can't uh, yogurt does funny things to my stomach depending on who makes it yeah and I did um, buy, I did buy some but, coconut oil today for cooking with yeah does that taste of coconut I haven't even opened it yet no it's just it's just fat all right cool you know, it's just a lot cleaner fat than otherwise yeah and I think sustainable. it smells I think it smells if you if you burn it like in a candle I think then it smells like coconut but I think if you fry your eggs in it, I don't think it tastes like coconut I like plants that haven't changed since paleolithic times that have always been things that we eat I find that interesting yeah you know, and coconuts yeah. will grow in, grow in certain parts of the world whether you want them to or not. Oh, they're, yeah, they're, they're an weird. amazingly tenacious plant. So I, I'm kind of fond of coconuts. But I thought, you know, if I was going to cook in something, because I want to make some... I've, I made granola last week, but I ended up making about three weeks' supply of granola. And it's really, really cheap because it's a couple of tablespoons of honey, some nuts, some oats, and a little bit of oil, and a pinch of salt. Mm. And that's largely it. And you can add things like flax seeds and stuff to it, so you're getting that protein in. And flax seeds are pretty cheap because you don't need a lot of them. So yeah, mm. so it does turn out to be cheaper. I've probably spent half as much on food, despite the fact I've had to buy new stuff that I just didn't have in the food cupboards because I wanted to mm. get a more, a healthier, like you say, single ingredient diet going. Yeah. And I did break that um, a couple of days ago. I had a pizza and some ice cream, which used to be my main diet of an evening. And it totally slowed me up. As does eating too much meat. Red meat in particular does slow you down. It does make it hard. If you eat a lot of red meat. I mean beef is okay because it's quite lean usually. But things like pork or salami or processed foods. Tend to make you very sluggish. Which I guess if you're sitting on your sofa watching television. They're the perfect food. And there's they're almost zero effort. <laughs> But, you know, doing a pizza takes about the same time as making a, a vegan curry or a curry that you've made from scratch from, you know, ingredients that are literally single thing ingredients. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, I don't think any of that was news to you, Harlequin, but... Um, and it wasn't news to me. I knew. I think the thing. I think the thing that. I think the thing that reminded me of bits and pieces was was the fist thing. Was the fist in the stomach size. That, yeah. I, I knew that, but it was just like, you know, I knew that from anatomy class back in the day. Yeah. But you know, it does make you awfully stop and think. You know, this is stuff we kind of know, but the last four weeks have been, let's put this to the test. Do I feel better now? I eat yeah. this, and the answer is definitely yeah. yes. And it costs a load less. I mean, there's a little bit of a setup yeah. cost if you're switching to different oils. So the only cooking oil I've got now is um, olive oil and coconut oil. Mm. And I'm kind of relieved that coconut oil doesn't have a coconutty taste because I was going to just use it for flapjacks, in which case it, it doesn't make any difference. And granola, which is just yeah. a, a flapjack mm. with no sense of self. It's an existentially yeah. damaged flapjack. 
And I think granola was probably invented because somebody didn't add enough honey to a set of flapjacks and just went, oh, shit, I'll just add milk. So I, I quite often have granola with, with zero fat yogurt and a bit of a smoothie just mixed yeah. in. And that will keep me going way past lunchtime. Mm. So, yeah, so it, it, eating healthily is cheaper. It is way, way better for you. And I think if I was eating, you know, I'd probably still lose weight if I was on the pizza and ice cream diet and just doing exercise. I'd eventually lose some well, weight. You would do. But, but the second I stopped know, exercising, you... it'll, it'll all come back again. Mm. So, yeah, I'm eating a lot less. I'm probably down to about two meals a day. Yeah. It was a bit of a mono diet today because I got some cheap off cuts of top sirloin beef that was cooked. And I haven't had a beef and horseradish sandwich in ages. I and mean, it was really cheap. I bought half a kilo of it for one pound fifty. It's like three Australian dollars. It cheap. was dirt cheap because yeah. it was basically use it today or tomorrow. Or you probably shouldn't eat it. Yeah. So it's sort of like yeah. I'm going to eat that now and get some sort of savage mm. levels of protein in my system. And I like beef and horseradish on brown bread. It's it's a great sandwich. Mm. So that you know, it was still cheap compared to buying half a dozen beef and horseradish sandwiches. Because I'll have them for yeah. for lunch tomorrow as well. But yeah, yeah, so that that doesn't sound like an awful lot of dietary advice. But it's all we can prove there at the moment. More you need yeah, it. there isn't there isn't a lot more. You can listen to a lot of random shit, like even that Impossible Burger that Whopper about the Burger King are about to do, the Impossible Whopper, and apparently it tastes just like a Whopper. But they were very they were very tight lipped on whether it was actually any good for you. Because it's got tons yeah. of fat in it. I mean, admittedly, it's coconut fat. Well, it's funny fat. because, yeah, because it's, it's it's interesting because things like that, you know, like you can go and make all sorts of things that, like I can reproduce all sorts of different things at work. Hmm. Yeah, but yeah. none of them you should eat. Yeah, I've, vegetarian or vegan food. So you can, I've, you can I've be met an unhealthy fat vegetarian vegetarians. Or vegan. I've I've met people that are morbidly yeah. obese that are vegetarians and vegans. Yeah. Because up until recently, there hasn't been a lot of choice. I'm I'm I need hmm. to go and try some vegan cheese. But what I resent about a lot of food that's cleared for vegans is it's more expensive than the meat option. Mm. When the actual cost to make it has got has got to be less. Yeah, but it, the reason for that is because um, do you know what I spoke about before? It's the a reason niche market. For that, I don't you. Not only that, it's also the um, it's also the um, the 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 cost cycle for um, animal welfare and also the cost cycle for um, de like land degradation isn't taken into account. Mm. Um, so you know we get you know you, you're buying cheap food stuffs to feed to animals that are killing them you know yeah um, faster because they're not living on food yeah. they should be eating you know cows are not eating grass which is what they're designed to eat they're, they're eating, eating cornmeal and bloody you know and soy which is really bad, for bad for them it makes them it's like yeah and, it's, that, and it's that's like why force feeding and lactose that's why intolerance products... people milk you know it'd be like giving you ice cream every day to fatten yeah. you up and then being all cross when you yeah. drop dead I mean, you know, yeah. it's the the thing about meat is, you know, we're omnivores. Mm. You know, we always have been. You know, it's been a fairly symbiotic relationship up until the last say thousand years, or probably even just five hundred yeah. years. Because even if even medieval mm. levels of farming didn't destroy the land, they understood if you fucked up the land, then you were going to starve, and they, you know, they figured yeah. it out eventually. Mm. But it's it's really bad for the planet. It's, we have to put it that no. way. If you're if you're going to be heroic, yeah. you know, don't knacker the planet. That's hero hero lesson number one. Is like try and yeah. try and walk a bit more lightly on the planet. You know, within reason. Mm. But you know, and it breaks the Maxine Green law of uh, if if your plan begins with if everybody, then it's doomed to failure. But yes. <laughs> you might as well get used to eating a lot less meat now because it's going to become next to impossible to eat to maintain this level of meat for much more than about the next ten years, if that. Yeah, yeah. If that, yeah. And it's you know the Amer the American right wing are now screaming about the the left wing coming for their hamburgers, and it's just like, <laughs> and actually it's you know cows produce an awful lot of methane, but they don't fart. This is the amazing thing, cows belch. Yes. This will save you from being shot down and straw manned by a right wing person in a conversation after dinner. Cows belch a lot of a lot of methane, which is a greenhouse gas, which is destroying the atmosphere and will bring us to global warming. But also the mm. degradation of the soil, given that 
something like 80% of all agricultural land is used to grow feed for meat animals. Yeah. And because of that, they're having to clear yeah, so millions of acres of forest they, every they year. Clear, they clear rainforest to do this. I mean, the one that, I mean, the one that did me was, um, I can't think of the guy's name. He wrote a book called Feral. Go and look him up. I can't think what his name is. He writes The Guardian as well. Um, but he came out, it was about a month ago, now I found this out, and it was a little, he was doing a talk somewhere or other, mm. and he's a very unstrict vegan, but his basic response was, he, he was going around, for the, like, looking at things for the EPA, or with the EPA, mm. and um, and he went and found out the research, and it's, the, in the whole of the UK, something like 40% of the Uplands moors produces something like 0.4% of the um, dietary requirements of the people of the UK through lamb. So we have 40% of the area of the UK locked up to feed, to, produ to produce a calorie surplus, like to produce a, a calorie allowance of 0.4%. 0, 0. And yeah. that's just insane. That's, especially like that's if just, you're on an island. You know, so if, like everyone, too many just, places if everyone just didn't eat lamb from the UK, yeah. just lamb just wasn't grown in the UK, you now have 40% of the, of, the, of the country back. You can just put forests in it. Yeah. You know. Which is just like that's just. But even if you, know, you if you, you say took, or not, took say like ten percent of that forty percent and you just grew something that people were actually going to eat, you know, yeah. our, our food security in the UK would be much much better. Yeah, It'd be way, and that's the thing is better. that if anyone knows anything about, I you know, I, I did agriculture as a, as a thing, and and sheep do not eat grass. You know, this is the thing: sheep are braziers, not graziers. So they eat everything. They eat trees and and nibble on leaves and do all sorts of stuff. That's what they're actually designed to eat. They're much more like a goat than they are like a cow. Hmm. Cow eats grass. Yeah, a horse eats grass. You know, sheep don't do that. You know, well, not, I've got, not I've got a certain amount of fondness for goats. I must admit, they got a lot of personality of goats. I don't because they destroy Australia. We have we have an, a very large issue of goat goat infestation in Australia. Yeah, well, anything that um, turns up. Know, in if Australia... anyone wants to eat, if anyone wants to eat goat, they're more than welcome to come to Australia. They can have as many as they want. It's a bit like deers and rabbits. I was concerned. If you want to eat meat, come to Australia and you can eat as many deers, goats, and rabbits as you want. Shoot anything on four legs. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing that rabbits were imported to Australia just so some pillock had something to shoot at. Yeah. You know, that's just. You would have thought they, they would have thought they would have learned after the Romans did what they did in the UK. Yeah, well, it's only in the last 150 years or so that rabbits have been wild in the UK. That's an amazing amount of adaptability they were initially caged animals grown for meat because they're pretty bloody portable yeah. you know roman mm. soldiers didn't eat a giant amount of meat a lot of what they ate was vegetables and this weird fish sauce that they used to make that's like a bit yeah. like worcester sauce which contains you know worcester sauce is a bloody healthy thing to get into if, if you like worcester sauce then you should put it on nearly everything because it is full mm. of those omega threes, it's full of the organic lean proteins and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's all like it's got fish oil, it's got fish in it, it's got all sorts of really good stuff for you. So if you like Worcester sauce, pour it on. The only thing that you know, don't drink it by the bottle because it's also got a shitload of salt in it. But it is, it, it it does fill that gap, which is why the Roman army used it because they were some of the best fed soldiers in the world. That's why they kept winning. Mm. You know, they didn't have crappy diets and they won. You know, they learned from people like the Spartans. You know, what do you give mm. your troops? Well, we give them this fish sauce and we give them fish. We give them meat when we've got it. But that's not every day and we give them a lot of vegetables. I'm not going to I'm not gonna say it right, but it's it's G-A-R-U-M, garam. Yeah. Garam fish sauce was Rome's favourite condiment. Yeah. There is and a very a, interesting video about it. It means that you don't have to give your guys specifically give them salt. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, salt was, salt was currency for the Roman soldiers. It wasn't something that they used a mm. lot of. Hence the word salary. There you go. New thing every day. That's why that's where the word salary comes from. It's the amount of salt that a soldier is paid. Yes. In the same way as the initial right, um, the initial currency of Japan was a koku, which is the amount of rice a family need a family of four needs for a year. Yes. Mm. Yeah. We're very food related, but yeah, we've been really looking for solid nutritional advice and there's yeah. just there just ain't any out there that isn't disproved by someone else what we've told yeah. you is the result of at least three weeks concentrated research of two people trying to find actual dietary, dietary advice and there ain't any 
everybody changes their mind. But what that eat more food, eat less crap thing is actually a balanced diet and your portion control will even that out. You know, if you do proper portion control and you try and engage in as much fruit and vegetables, organic lean protein, omega-3 fatty acids and water, you're going to be on a good start. And anything that's been artificially sweetened, stay the hell away from it. Mm. Now, it's even worse than refined sugar. You know, you're better off drinking a small amount of Coca-Cola and lots of water than a large amount of any diet drink. It's bad. It's bad for you guys. Mm. And it's cheaper. So what? So yeah. the last thing on the list of stuff that we've done, it was the make, do and mend time or make do and mend day or it's also known as a field day which is interesting um, misanthropic gods told me that um, which means you know just basically do all those set aside some time to just maintain everything so polish your shoes do your laundry repair things that need repairing and I put in something that's actually really working out well for me <clears throat> take pick a day where you don't have as much to do and get in touch with people you haven't got in touch with in a while. If you get the option. Mm. If you've got like half an hour, it doesn't actually take a lot to just text everybody to see if they're all right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, the people that you haven't spoke to in a while, if you spoke to someone the previous day and you text them, say, is everything okay? They might wonder why. But if you haven't spoken mm. to someone in a couple of weeks, ping them. Just send a text yeah. or pick up the phone, yeah. you know, or go and see them. And that actually leads to a certain sense of well-being. We're back to the oxytocin hit again. And, you you know, you just reconnect with your tribe. And that's a mm. good thing to do because it's all too easy to work and sleep and eat and that's it. Mm. You know, just take out half an hour and send like half a dozen texts. I mean, don't do it every week at the same time because I think they'll probably twig. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you're anything well, like me, you, you know, you, you sort of get wrapped up in what you're doing and all of a sudden it's a month since you last spoke to someone. Yeah. And that's where modern technology comes in. Because your phone will tell you when you last texted them. Just go through your contacts list mm. and see when the last text that you exchanged was. And if it's been more than a couple of weeks, send that person a message. If it's someone you want to see again, I mean, don't get weird and stalkery. Yeah. And sort of like send all your ex-girlfriends or ex-boyfriends a text saying, you know, how are you doing? All at once. Um, partially because it's weird. And partially because they might all text back at once and you'll get confused about which one you're speaking to. So, yeah, lessons learned. <laughs> don't do that but yeah polish your boots you need you need polished boots mm. there's a reason people clean their shoes they last a lot longer if you look after them because it's water damage that destroys the stitching usually on a you know that that will be where the sole will start to separate from the shoe if you don't look after them mm. you don't put that seal of polish in the gap between the sole and the upper it knackers shoes really quickly especially if you work doing dishes because your, your boots get wet yes. all the time so yeah, yeah that's I normally get filth on them. That's what we've learned in yeah. in four weeks. Four you know, weeks. We've learned also learned that we don't like. I don't think either of us like running yet. <laughs> uh, I say yet because no, I don't I, like running as such. I, I don't I, like I running. Did, I, do I do remember I do having like the sensation after I've stopped yeah, running. Yeah, it's like banging your I head do against feel like the wall. Something I have to do. Yeah. Yeah. But it's good. I mean, uh, the, also uh, on the archive.org, there is a link on every recent Urban Agoga video to the army training course. So you can have a look at it and mm. laugh at what we're going to put ourselves through. But it is good. You know, you, you get used to doing things you don't want to. But I think that helps in the tidying your house and being more organized. Because mm. I've noticed that since I started the running, I'm more into looking around my house and going, yeah, that's a five minute job. I'll do that. That's a 30 second job to put that there in its right place. And you tend to be a bit more yeah. systematic because you have got mm. this thing that you're partaking in over the week and you've got targets to set. But the cool thing about running if you're on your own is if you use something like Runkeeper, which is a free app, it'll tell you how fast you covered the distance and how long you were running for and stuff. And so you can compete with um, previous incarnations of yourself. So you can say, well, you know, I did that many push ups or I did that. Um, I did that run in a faster time or I covered more distance in that time period mm. so you can you can keep track of your progress and you can call yourself you know call your previous self a, a, a lazy sluggard for not having done this earlier because this whole thing's only four months I mean 
if you're if you're listening to this and you're much much younger than me do it now because i wish i yeah. had i wish in my 20s i'd just gone right i'll do this because i'd probably be a lot wealthier by now because if you're a systematic person and you sort of go right and you and i and i'd made real proper plans 20 or 30 years ago i'd be doing pretty well by now mm. so yeah it's all working out so uh have you got any plans for the next four weeks? Are you going to try anything new? Um, uh, try not to yell at anyone. That's probably a big one for me. Yeah. Don't get cranky. I found myself I getting less cranky think, with people. Have you? Yeah, I think meditate more or try to meditate more. Mm. It's one thing I always fall over in doing. Yeah, me too. Um, certainly, certainly, like, you know, write the daily list and get on and just get on and, and actually write the daily list because I'm one of those people who I dislike having I dislike having the list of things I have to do but it, it yeah. really does help it's not environmentally friendly um, but I really like physical lists where you can cross stuff out yeah you just no, like I find annihilate that, I find that all the of the apps that I've ever tried don't work yeah I, um, they I, just annoy the shit out of me although there is a free app called P-Task which is good for keeping a, a, yeah. an idea of your longer term goals it's pretty mm. it's not very good for things I'd like to get done by the end of today because you tend no. to put them in and if they're very short jobs then you tend to cross them out just as quick but they don't appear crossed out which you could use but mm. i think if you write a physical list and everybody's got try and use yeah, scrap paper that you're not going to use for uh, anything else and if you've printed stuff out where you've got pieces of paper that are only written on one side staple them together and make a scrap notebook for your lists so you just scrub mm. stuff out and it's just done but yeah lists are always good um, and I've been I've been keeping a journal, but um, and it's got like I've I do a, a page with the tasks for the week, and I put a tick next to them if they're done. But I'm also writing down my wins, as in things I have done that weren't on the list that were useful. So if I do the laundry or the mm. washing up, I write that down. If I got exercise that day, I write that down. Or if I've uploaded a video or done something else or tidied something that wasn't on the list. Yeah. It's written in, so I've got a note of, damn, I'd be productive. Because it's a good feeling. Yeah. And I'm going to have a crack at this sleep learning thing. Although I've sort of said tech in the in the bedroom is a bad idea. Uh, I think an MP3 player. Because apparently there is, there, is, there is scientific proof that you learn things better if you listen to lectures on the thing that you're trying to learn about while you sleep. Mm. Your recall... You know the sense of familiarity and, and probably some pattern recognition thrown in there too does yeah. tend to sort it out um yeah i've already sort of yeah. stopped yelling at people unless they really do things that i've told them a million times yes i think one of the things that you can do is marvel at someone you know if somebody does something repeatedly that's getting on your nerves that almost seems to be their superpower tell them that you're almost in awe of their ability to get in your mm. way or the, their ability to not do something despite having been told and just look at them in like rapt attention and it's like i don't know how you do it you know i ignore people but you're really just not listening to an almost olympic gold level yeah. that, but that's kind of passive aggressive so but it does work <laughs> but it means that you don't have to yell because when you lose your temper you get angrier because somebody's made you look almost weaker because they've managed through their inattention to make you cross. And that's the thing I think that bothers me the most. And it annoys me to sometimes to be try and be nicer. But generally speaking, you can you can you can just say like try it try a different way of saying it. Mm. I mean I, well, I, 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 I s I've spent two years trying to tell the staff not to tap the plates to get the food off them against the side of the bin. Because it's a big sort of like heavy duty plastic collar that sits on the work surface that leads to the bin. And every so often a plate will just come apart in the sink because it's hot water. Yes. And it'll just give up the yeah. ghost with all these internal fractures. And I've tried yeah. saying, look, I don't want any more scars from this job. Because I've, I've had yeah. some really impressive cuts. Because newly broken yeah. glazed ceramics are really sharp. It's quite sharp. It's yes. amazingly sharp. It's so sharp you can cut yourself and not know until blood's pouring down your hand because it's such yeah. a clean incision like it's actually sliced through the nerves rather than drag them into the air where they can start telling you about the pain you're in so instead yeah. I've said I want you to imagine 
the plate that you're serving someone with comes apart while you're giving them their food like there's a crack in it so deep that it's literally going to fall apart do you think you're going to get a tip the tip off someone that you've poured you know scalding hot food into their lap because mm. that could be a real risk if you do that and shatter and basically put cracks in the plate so yeah you know it's tell, tell people a different way yeah. and just keep telling them and when they say you've already told me this yeah but i'm telling you in a different way why are you telling me a different way because i didn't seem to get through to you with the last way i told <laughs> you the first time yeah so i think i think i think we have to leave it at that with, yeah. with we'll come back in four weeks time and we'll tell you a different way hmm. but yeah eat better get exercise wake up early that's it's all good stuff yeah. and if you want the full list of everything we've discussed there'll be a link below this video so you can download it and that's the yeah. four weeks of distilled urban a go gate and uh harlequin's going to be filming a little bit more hopefully so we can include his videos in as bonus videos hopefully with the urban a go gate so you can check out somebody else walking around instead of me you can have special shaky cam yeah and if you want me to if you want me or harlequin to have less shaky cam there is a PayPal um, thing on every video as well. Well, help out that way. Yeah, if you want to help out the channel. Right but if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, please listen to all the video all the way through. It's not as easy on this one because it is nearly two hours long. Um, but if mm. if you want to help the channel, watch the video all the way to the end. Um, like and subscribe and hit notifications because it really games the YouTube algorithm. Because what we're doing it is depends. we're we're distilling all those fluffy self help books down into stuff you can actually use. And we're putting it in document form. This the document for this whole episode is only one and a half pages long. But it, it is everything we've discussed, it's just we've expanded on it a bit. But yeah, mm. we are we are both better off for doing it. I know there are people that are out there watching this and not doing it, and that's cool. But if you're gonna watch it and not do it, please help out and you know, get it help get it to the people that will go, Holy shit, but it does really work. Just get out that yeah. door on day one. And you'll find yourself building those habits and constructing that better, I don't know, a more productive life. Just produce, be more productive, not to be some dickhead CEO of a company that makes money through passive income. You wouldn't believe how many bloody of those adverts I've had to watch in the last month. Thousands. Because to get towards the actual self-help videos, of which there will be one sentence that's useful, that's what they always put up as adverts. It's bloody infuriating. And I want people to be just happier. Because happier people don't start wars or fuck up the planet. Excuse me for swearing, but it's, it is that important. It is that urgent. We need a lot more people that are a lot more chilled out and happier. And going to help other people to be happier. Because happy people aren't racist or genocidal idiots. Yeah. I want a t-shirt with that on. <laughs> happy people don't commit genocide or murder and then get arrested or taken to one side by police officers at the station or the airport. Anyway, I think that's it. I think we're wrapped up. We're good. Have fun. Enjoy okay. everyone, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for listening, and do take care. <laughs>